Welcome to the Ceres podcast, everyone. I'm Stelios, the founder and director of Ceres, but not the host for today. In this episode of the Ceres podcast with Mark Petru, we're thrilled to host a fascinating discussion between good friends, Mark and Gordon Hillam. For those of you that don't know Gordon, he used to own the Townhead Cafe in Bigger and is a previous Seafish Fish and Shit Show of the Year winner. He won the prestigious, prestigious award in 2008, which feels like a long time ago. But fast forward, and he is now the Scottish area manager for KFE Limited. As I was listening to this episode, it had me laughing, but at times nearly crying. But maybe I'm getting a bit soft. If you want to discuss this episode further, then join the discussion in our Sarah's podcast discussion group on Facebook. Today's episode is proudly sponsored by our Serres Natural Degreaser, your ultimate ally against stubborn grease. This potent natural formula effortlessly cuts through through the toughest grease stains, offering a high performance clean without the harsh chemicals. Ideal for professional kitchens, this powder degreaser excels on greasy surfaces from equipment and utensils to floors and walls. It's completely non-caustic, biodegradable and works wonders in all water conditions making it safe and sustainable for all your cleaning needs prepare to transform your cleaning routine with the sheer power of the Serres natural degreaser the safer choice for tackling the most stubborn demands a great use case is using it with really hot water and filling sinks and flushing the sink pipes and then drains naturally degreasing the flow pipes to purchase your Serres natural degreaser with free next day delivery across mainland UK, visit serres.shop. Stay updated with Serres by following us on social media and subscribing to our mailing list. The links will be in the episode show notes. Your support means a lot to us. So if you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends, post it on social media, but consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. Now, let's jump into today's episode with Mark Petru and Gordon Hillen. Okay, here we, here we are um, at last. Uh, I've, yeah. uh, I feel like I've not seen you for about twenty minutes. <laughs> well, it, well been... it's usually twenty minutes, Mark, but it's probably more like an hour. Yeah, well, we've we've um, we spent the last two days together, which is probably the, the most time we've spent together ever. But we've got another day tomorrow, so um, oh, you know, spending three days and an evening. Um, you, you must be sick of me already, but um, no, thank no, you so you much what? for coming on. I'm... I'll tell you what, the, the first day that I've seen you uh, in this episode, uh, I, I was impressed how much you had reinvented yourself because at the open day on Sunday, um, you're normally late, you weren't late, which was an absolute, <laughs> which was an absolute milestone. And then at the end of the open day, you actually cleaned up after. I couldn't believe it. I thought somebody. I know you saw. I thought somebody had abducted my Mark Petru and put some other person in that was uh, <laughs> that, that, that wanted to clean up. But I think what you were trying to do was uh, shame the other uh, KFE personnel into helping you, but that didn't happen. I knew that wasn't going to happen before you started. But anyway. yeah, I think it's the first time you've seen me with wet hands in a sink yeah. for fourteen yeah. years. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, I, I, I knew that we were going to. Fourteen years, <laughs> Jesus! It goes in a blink, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, mate. So, um, I, I, um, I knew that we were going to have this chat today, and um, and I, I, I thought I'm going to pull out all the stops just to just to you know um, get you in the right frame of mind to <laughs> to <laughs> to chat to me tonight. But I'm really glad that we that we're doing this. Um, yeah. For people um, that that don't know, you, you and I, we work together at the KFE training school, teaching yeah. new people um, how to how to enter the fish and chip trade, and also 
uh, more experienced people come back to sharpen up their skills. Yeah, and, um, and, and so we've, we've, uh, we've, we've kind of bonded through, through training I, um, since, well, 2010, like 14 years. Um, yeah. Do you know but, uh, in all the that time. Will, the office will have, uh, the office will have exact figures, but that's, uh, that's pretty much a thousand people that we've trained over the last 13, 14 years yeah. in, the, in the training school. And that's only the ones that come to the training school. That's not the ones that you and I go to train on site elsewhere. So that's that's a thousand people. That's yeah. that's good one. Yeah. So well done yeah. you, well yeah, done we've, me. We've, we've, um, yeah, well done us. Um, in all that time though, I've never yeah. really got your story. We've never yeah. had that time to sit down because we're always... Um, invest in and knowledge sharing with other people. So yeah. I want to take you back to your early life and yeah. how you got into fish and chips. Um, take me through that because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm actually just as a friend, as a mate, just really interested to hear your story. Okay. Um, so when you say early life, you want to know where I come from and who I who I was when I was yeah okay then let's do that. So, Why do you talk that way, Gordon? Oh, <laughs> Tell me, where does the accent come from, Mark, <laughs> Mark? If you want to take me through early life to to, to right today, that's going to how much how much time have you got? <laughs> have you got <laughs> we've got we've a got while. a bit of time. We've got right. Okay. Well. Um, I wasn't born into a, a privileged background. Um, I was born in the, the mid sixties. Um, I was born in in Hamilton in the South Lanarkshire. Um, I was born in an era where uh, you you had respect for police officers and doctors and teachers, and generally you had you had respect. You were kind of born with respect for your elders, which was uh, which was good. I lived in a, a tenement building. We didn't, as I say, we didn't come from a privileged background. Um, I was, I was, I lived in a tenement building, and um, well, I suppose we were privileged in comparison to some of the people that were living in tenement buildings. Because I don't know if you're aware what, what tenement buildings are um, in Scotland. Uh, that you have when they build t- um, flats, you have a room and kitchen, you have a room and kitchen, and there's a little space in the middle. And they called that a single end. I don't know whether you get that in England or not, but this was a single end. So uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, when I say that we are we weren't privileged, we were more privileged than, than the people that than the neighbours that were living in the single end because the single end would have um, only one room, but that would be your kitchen, your your bedroom, your living room. You didn't have a toilet because that was outside, but. Your bedroom and your kitchen and your living room were all in one. And pals of mine in, in that in that era had lived in single ends. And later on in life, I always wondered how they managed to conceive four children all under school age when they just when they just lived in the one bed. They, they had one bed for the whole the whole family, you know. And um, so we had a room and kitchen. So that I suppose that put us a bit uh, a bit more privileged than them. Um, but I was there till I was about till I was about seven years old, and then the the whole place fell down, and um, we then moved into a new council estate or a scheme, as we called it, um, um, in Hamilton. But there were happy days, Mark. You know, there was there was seven of us in one house in a three bedroom house. Um, there were there were happy days. Right. Um, my father worked very very hard, but he had three jobs. Um, he drove a bus. He, uh, he was a hairdresser and he had a part-time job in the, in the chip shop, a chip shop in Bells Hill. But they were, they were, the, they were the days where um, you didn't have bullying the same and mental health was, was, was not a thing that ever, that ever crossed your mind because these things were dealt with on a, on a daily basis, you know, usually in the, usually in the playground at school. Um, and I'd, I'm not saying that that was that was right or that was wrong, but but we got by, you know. You 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 kind of dealt with the uh, issues as they came up. So you learn very very early that uh, you need to look after yourself. 
Um, it was also a, it was also a time where um, you could leave dog shit on the on the pavement and and nobody cared. Um, and it was also a time where you could throw rubbish out of your your car window, and again nobody cared. They just gave somebody a job to pick it up. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, there were happy times. So we're living in a scheme in the. Uh, in Hamilton, on the outskirts of Hamilton. And um, again, you learn very, very quickly that anything that you want in life, you're going to have to work for. Because I see my, my mum and dad didn't have uh, didn't have a lot of money. They, they got by. They, they got us the, the essentials, you know. We always had a roof over our head. We always had, we always had food. But there was no... Um, there was no extras for, for luxuries like cigarettes or cans of beers at at the weekends, you know. So I learned very quickly that you had to work for those. And my pal had a paper run and he was relocating. Him and his family were re- relocating. And I remember having a conversation with him and he said, do you want a paper job? And I went, a paper job? I'm a, I'm a bit, maybe, I'm first year at school, so I'm 11, 12. And, um, and I took this paper and all it consisted of, he didn't have an interview or anything like that in the days we, he took me into the shop and he said, this is Gordon, he's going to do my papers after I leave next week. And the woman went, all right, OK, Gordon, all the numbers are written on the on the, the papers, all you have to do is put them through the right door. So so that was the start of my paper and that was the, the, the early days. My brother and I, my older brother and I, uh, worked in the, the chip shop for my dad on a, on a Sunday. We'd go in and sweep the floor and just do things so that he could give us 50p. But the paper job... The paper job was uh, early morning um, and then after school and uh, and that paid me £3.25 a week um, and only tips at Christmas. So, yeah, was what it was. Um, progressing from there, got I got a job. Me and my pal went to... We, we, sn- we sneaked on the bus at, uh, at Hamilton Bottom Cross and we went to... We got on the bus up to Lanark and that was a distance of about 15 miles. But in, from Lanark to Hamilton, there was orchards and, and nurseries that grew tomato plants and cucumber and lettuce and stuff like that. And you would sell them at the side of the road on a Saturday and a Sunday because that was down the that was down where the River Clyde runs. So that was a very, very busy area. So we would be, me and my pal would be in there. Uh, we got that job. Oh, we, we got the bus up to Lanark and we went into every single nursery on the way down the road. Uh, until we eventually got a job, and it was a Saturday Sunday job, and uh, and I loved it. It was absolutely brilliant. Very very hard work, but but I loved it, and I loved going out and selling tomatoes at the side of the road. But you don't get that anymore. And no. from there, from there, um, I'd heard that they were looking for staff in one of the supermarkets in the town centre in in Hamilton. So I'm about. Well, I'm about maybe going on 15, 15 at that point. And uh, and I got that job. I got that job three days after school and a Saturday. And my dad picked me up on a Saturday after I finished in the supermarket and took me out to the chip shop to do a Saturday night in the chip shop. We didn't see a lot of my dad because I was always, he was obviously always working. So... Um, so that was a kind of that was a kind of bonding session that you that you had with, with your dad at that at that age, you know. You went to work for him, but but hey, it was good. Um, so that was uh, so that was you, my kind of start into the the real the real world. When I started working in the supermarket, I always wanted to always wanted to do things better than than just do it. You know, I mean, I, 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 maybe that sounds a bit silly, but. Um, I'll give you an example. The, so I'm working in this supermarket, and it was in the days where um, you got good service in the supermarket. You know, when 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 the supermarket workers actually moved out of the way for the customers and stuff like that, that doesn't happen anymore. You have to move out. The customer has to move out of the way for them. But in the days, you took the you took an old lady's trolley to the to the car and put her put her shopping in. The, I was going to say messages. But you guys don't know what messages are. In Scotland, a shop, a food shop is called messages. We go to messages. So you put the messages in the car, the shopping in the car. So that was the level of service that you gave to um, to customers in the supermarket in the 80s. 
So it was three days, three nights a, a week after school and uh, and a Saturday. And the manager in there was, it was a guy called Brian Seeky, I never, I never forget his name. And he was as sharp as a, he was as sharp as a razor. He always dressed very, very smart. And he always had direction, you know, he never, he was one of those guys that, you never saw him floundering about anywhere or messing with words or anything like that. He had direction. And, and I thought the guy was brilliant. The guy, he was, I was, I was 15. He was maybe, I don't know, 40 at that point. But I thought he was absolutely brilliant. And, um, and, and I learned a lot from him. He said to me, he said, he gave me a task one day. So, um, the, just talking about doing things better. He said to me one day, it was a Saturday. He said, the, the guy that, that works the back door, and what we called the back door was, what you would do is you would collect all the rubbish from the, the store, all the rubbish from the store, all the rubbish from the storeroom, and all the rubbish from the, the back door, and you put it in the big cages. And the cages would go down the elevator, you'd feel them outside, and there was a big compressor outside. And what you had to do on your back door duty was fill the compressor and compress all the rubbish that, that had been collected over the course of the week. So, the guy that usually did that, that job, the guy that always did that job was off this Saturday. That was unheard of that he was off. But So, the manager said to me, I need you to do that, so yeah, that's fine. Collected all this stuff, down the cages went, out the back door. But they shut the door when you're out, they shut the door. I says, all right, okay then, so I'm out there. And there was no health and safety around like that, so the compressor you had to jump in, so that the rubbish went down before it clapped, before it, it came along and compressed all the. Yeah, it was a bit dangerous, but it was exciting. I liked it. Um, so after I'd finished doing that job, I went into the. I took a walk around the front because obviously I'm locked out at that point. So I walked around the front. As I walked in the shop, the the manager came up and he said, "I gave you a job to do." I said, "I've done it." And no, I haven't. I said, I've done it. He went, no, nah, you've only been out there for two hours. I said, all right, okay. I said, well, I must have missed something then. So we've gone down the back door, he's opened the door and he went, oh, job's done. What I didn't know was the guy that always does the job was out there the whole day, but he went to the bookies, he went to the pub, <laughs> and, and he generally made a, a day of it. So Jesus Christ, did that take pelters off of him when he came back? Because then he, the manager knew that that job only takes only takes two hours to do. But um, but they were fun days. They were they were good days as well. Um, I loved working, Mark. I loved getting the money, and, and the pay in there was seventeen and a half quid for the week. So I'm progressing through life, you know. As I say, my dad used to yeah. pick me up on a, a Saturday after after I uh, finished in the supermarket. I'd finish at five o'clock. And he'd be waiting out the door uh, to pick me up and, and take me to the, the chip shop for a for a night shift. So, so it came to a that, point that, where... That was where you... The one, sorry? Sorry. No, no, go, go. I, no, I want to hear it, it all. It came to a point I was where... Gonna, I was going to say... That. It, was, it was school leaving, you know. I left school when I was just going on 17. So... Um, the manager in the in the supermarket pulled me up to the office. He said, uh, we're looking for trainee managers. And I went, oh, brilliant, man. Love it. I'd love to. But then at that point, the um, my dad had cut down to just the job in the chip shop. So he was full time in the chip shop. But his boss, his boss, who owned, he owned half the country at one time, his, his gaffer. Um, so he was a very wealthy man. But he was selling off a lot of... Uh, a lot of stuff that, that he didn't want anymore. And one of those things was the chip shop. So my dad was faced, this was in 1980, 19, yeah, 1980, 1980, 1981, somewhere about there. So um, he was faced with uh, maybe hasn't got a job next week when the, the shop gets sold or taken out a loan to, to buy the shop. And him and his gaffer had a, a very good relationship, so his gaffer said to him, if you want to buy the shop, I'll take you to my bank manager. He'll give you the loan, you pay them back, He'll pay the bank manager will pay me, and you've got a chip shop. So um, I remember having that conversation with my dad. I went in and said, oh, I'm going to be a manager in the supermarket. And he went, no, you're not. And he went, 
what do you mean? He said, you're coming to work with me in the chip shop. I went, all oh, right, okay. So my life was kind of forged before. I, I didn't I didn't really, I, I, I suppose I could have had the choice. If I, I could have fought back and said, no, I want to go to the supermarket. But I like the chip shop. I like the I like the I like the interaction with the customers. I like the interaction with the staff. I like being with my dad in the in the chip shop. So packed in the supermarket and went to work full time in the chip shop, and that's that was my so entry you, into into the fish and chip world. So you kind of um, fell into retail in the early days, and then got got brought into the chip shop because you got to see your dad, and by then. You'd already got the customer, been bitten by the customer bug. You, you sort of yeah. already got talking to customers and and, and um, yeah, that found that, that, that was, was something you enjoyed me, he doing. Was, he was paying me more, so what's not to like? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I thought <laughs> there could be worse things than working for your dad and getting paid more than you would be for a trainee manager in a supermarket. Yeah. But, uh, so, so that, that my, that's that how you started early. in. Yeah. That's See, I never early. knew you worked with your dad in the chippy. Oh, I worked with my dad for, well, he retired. Well, <laughs> as as time went on, uh, yeah, you, you get you get a passion for uh, for working in the in the chip shop. I loved working in the chip shop, and then well, I started dating Sandra and. Uh, and and she got a job in the chip shop as well. So we were working together. It was a kind of it was a family family affair with lots of staff. So it, it it's not as if it was head on all all day every day with family members with with lots of staff as well. So um, so that was uh, for the for the, for the benefit of the listener. I for the benefit the listener. Sandra is your wife. And, she is and, indeed. And, and, she has been for forty years. years. She has been for forty years. And what a lovely lady she is too. She, she has, but don't tell her that I said that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that was it. That, yeah, that was nineteen nineteen eighty one. By the time, but I didn't like change in the chip shop. He didn't like anything to change. It was the same all the time. You know, he's he would make steak pie. He would, in the days we'd done breakfast, so you would get. You'd walk out of the shop in the morning. The breakfast were already on, you know, and, and you had you had uh, square sausage and 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 fried eggs and griddled uh, pancakes. Not not pancakes like the wafer thin pancakes that you get, but the the real Scotch pancakes. So those those were all fried up, and you you got spoiled when you walked in because some of the old women that uh, that that worked in the shop for for my dad's old boss were still there. So um, you got spoiled then, you know, when you walked in, they said, oh, hi, Gordon's son, there's your wee breakfast for you, it's your pancakes and your sausage. So I, I loved it. I loved it. It was great. Um, the work was quick. It was quite hard. I'm sure that most of the, the listeners that are on here now will, will appreciate the fact that uh, working the chip shop is not easy. It's long hours and it's uh, it can be very difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, I worked I think anyone who, who's worked with... Anyone who's worked with their dad will appreciate. Anyone that's worked with their yep. dad will appreciate that dads don't like change. So at, at some point there must have been uh, a conversation where uh, I'm not the boss's son anymore. You're the boss's yeah. dad. When did yeah. that happen? <laughs> that was um, well. It, it, it fought against change so much that I remember he bought a new range. He bought a new range. <coughs> Uh, we had uh, we had traditional ranges. We'd, we'd a Preston Thomas range, but when I started working in the chip shop, the range was about 35, 40 years old. So I'm sure that a lot of people will remember those ones. You had to light them with uh, with tapers. You know, you were you were putting a light on a, on the end of a a, a taper and putting it in a gas chamber, yeah. and and it lit. I and remember. It usually took, usually took your eyebrow off. Yeah, it usually took your eyebrow. Off. But my dad would service his own range. So if you went yeah. in on a Sunday, he would have all the panels off the front of the range, smoking a fag, and you'd say, Dad, <laughs> what, what's, what's the problem? I thought I smelled gas last night. All right, okay, then. So you think, oh, fuck. <laughs> he's, got, he's, got a lighted, he's got a lighted flame in the, in the gas chamber. But anyway, 
So, um, so it's time for a new range, and uh, he said to me, "And this is this is this is Dad's giving you your place in life." He said to me, "We need a new range." I said, "Yeah." He said, "Would you like to go and find out and see what kind of range you would like?" I said, "Yeah, I would." But what he actually meant was how many pans you want, right? So anyway, so I goes away. And I had, and at that point, the the round and square pan technology was just coming into the the UK from uh, from Holland, and I loved these things. I loved, I loved, yeah. I loved reading about them in in magazines, and I loved to go to exhibitions and and see them and touch them. You know, they were they were they were the dog's bollocks for me. They were everything, and I would just love one. You know, so I, I found out all about it and and how they work, and the, I priced them as well. And I remember going into the shop one day. And he said, uh, I said, that I've got all that information on that range. And he went, all right, he said, in you come. He said, I want you to meet somebody. So I've gone in and he's, he's chatting to this, uh, this man that I've never seen before. He said, this is Keith Preston. I went, oh, for fuck's sake. We're getting a fucking Preston in Thomas <laughs> range again. But this time it's not a three pan, it's a four pan. And it lights itself. All you have to do is press a button that lights itself. So... My involvement in that was, uh, what colour of Formica would you like on the front? I said blue. He went, I thought you'd say burgundy, so we're going with the burgundy, Keith. And Keith Preston went, yeah, that's absolutely fine, no problem. So we got a new Preston in Thomas Range. Um, so that's how much he didn't like change in the chip shops. But I, I, yeah. I, I, loved, I loved to change things. I loved to change the way, the way that I was frying. He didn't like me doing that. So I was kind of restricted in, in what I could do. Until uh, until about nineteen ninety nine, and uh, and him and I worked closely together for for all those years. But nineteen ninety nine, he got falsely accused of uh, tax evasion, um, and I say falsely accused because nobody under declared um, turnover in the days. Nobody. So he was he was falsely accused of. He wasn't actually falsely accused. He fucking done it. He knows he did it, and I can say that because he's not here now. <laughs> and and probably the tax inspectors that that, that targeted him in the days are not here now either. But um, yeah, so he got he got he got falsely accused of uh, of, of under under declaring um, revenue to HMRC, and uh, that. That was that went so big that it went from your local tax officer will take you back for six years. Um, but what they un- uncovered was uh, he paid the same amount to his uh, PAYE every month. I didn't. I wasn't aware of this. He was paying like three hundred and twenty-five pound and seventeen pence every single month. Nobody was ever off. Nobody worked extra shifts. Jesus. But anyway, so. Um, so yeah, he got falsely accused, and it went to a special compliance office in Edinburgh, and they take you back twenty years, not six. They take you back twenty years, so he got a massive tax bill wow. that he couldn't pay. Um, so he had to sell the shop. So we're in a position where I, I, I had no money to buy the shop. I, I, I had a house by that time. Uh, I had a mortgage, uh, yeah. but I had equity on the house. I had insurances and stuff like that. So I had. I was in a better financial position then than I was. When I when I started working for him, and I was great. I had done some. Uh, I I had done some um, marketing uh, courses and stuff like that. I'd been on a marketing course for 11, 11 weeks. I loved it. It was brilliant. It was it was put on by North Lanarkshire Council, and um, and I wasn't going to go. And Sandra said, "Why are you not going to go to that that course?" And I said, it's on a Monday night. I only get a Monday night off. It's the only time I get to spend with the kids. She says, the kids don't even want to see you on a Monday night. So I said, right, okay then. So so I went to this course on a Monday night for 11 weeks. It was supposed to be 11 weeks. I think it went to about 15. But I loved it. I just got I just got addicted to it. And the guy that ran it, it was a guy called uh, Archie McLeod, and he was a brilliant guy. He knew everything about everything. And I thought, wow, I fucking didn't even know half the things that, that I'm learning so I, I got addicted to that. So I w- it, it got me to a point where I was great at writing proposals, and and I had also done a a, a course on um, bookkeeping. 
I'm a member of the Institute of Certified Bookkeepers. Well, I used to be that. That that has probably gone now, but, but in the days I was a member of the Institute of Certified Bookkeepers. So I thought, before I started the, the course, uh, somebody had mentioned the, the double entry system to me. I thought the double entry system was a lewd sex position, but it wasn't. It was something to do with... <laughs> It was something to do with bookkeeping. So I learned I learned all these things and I was great at I was great at writing proposals. So what I had to do was when, when my dad had to uh, sell the shop, I had to write a proposal. I had I had a little bit of equity on the house. But coupled with that I had to I had to write a proposal for the bank. And I wrote this brilliant proposal. I think I've still got it. It was fucking brilliant. I I, I read it time and time again to see, to see how because I, I couldn't believe how good it was you know and I took it into the bank and um, I had nobody to hold my hand I went to the bank myself and I sat there in front of the manager and he said you're very young for taking on such a, a big loan and I said thanks I wish I still had that problem but <laughs> oh, no anyway so um, <laughs> so uh, so yeah, they approved this. They approved this loan, and I and I bought the shop. I bought the shop for my dad. He retired when he was sixty years old, and there I was, amazing, in charge of in charge of a chip shop with a five year old Preston and Thomas Range that I didn't want, and uh, <laughs> some uh, improvements because my dad didn't like change, and he refused to he refused to spend money in the shop. He'd rather. He, he, it it buy a new. My mum got a new car every two years, and it was always a better one than the last two years. It was a better one than the two years before. It was a better one. But spend money in the shop, absolutely not. So I had a, I had a chip shop that, that, that was in, in need of repair, in need of progress, and um, and I had a bank loan round my my neck that would have choked a donkey. But. Um, and this was this the Townhead Cafe that uh, No, this is the this is the Alhambra the, Cafe in Bells Hill. This is the Alhambra in Bells Hill. Okay. That was that was our family shop. Um that was a that was a community shop but we, we were integrated to the community. We, we we did a lot with the community, a lot of a lot of sponsorship, a lot of uh, because these 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 people were not only not only customers but they became friends as well, you know. You, you get that with the community shop. Townhead was a little bit different. That was more of a more of a tourist uh, area, so you would only you would only see people occasionally. Um, but anyway, so there I am in in a chip shop, and I'm married with a couple of little kids, and uh, we started on economic development strategies, things like quality awards. Um, entry into Young Fish Friday of the Year, not for me, but for the the staff that I'd taken on. Um, we we embraced all the sea fish initiatives. We were already getting local business awards. We progressed into uh, accreditation for investors and people, and um, and the whole thing was busy. And, and and all of a sudden, things started picking up. I think I doubled the turnover in in less than a year. The real turnover. <laughs> I doubled the real turnover in less than a year, and that was just with economic development. You know, uh, moving things that he would never move, like clearing out areas for customers to stand in, making them a bit more attractive, um, improving the service, the level of customer service that we had, getting new uniforms and stuff like that. So I loved doing all that. It was uh, it was great. And fun. that came. Did and, that uh, come from the marketing <laughs> experience that you got? Yeah. The what? Sorry. Did that come from the marketing experience that you gained on those on that eleven that, week course? That came from that. Some of that came from the the marketing experience that, that I'd learned. But there was a there was a system there in the, in those days, Mark, and, and the, it, it was I don't know. I was going to say an accreditation um, type thing, but it was more of a a learning thing. It was called Scotland's Best, and it was centered. It was. It was focused on the uh, the hospitality industry, and I bought in. I bought into that every single time. I sent all my staff on this Scotland's best course, and um, and, and uh, things like that were an addiction for me. I just loved doing them. I, I loved the. I loved the interaction. I love to see the when you come back to the shop and implement 
it's kind of like our like our training our training school. You know, you can you can bang on for two days to students in the in the training school and think that they're not listening, but it's what they do with that information and knowledge when they go back to their shops. Once they implement, once they start yeah. implementing, I've done I've done the same. I've been on these courses and thought, oh, I knew that, I knew that, I knew that, I knew that. But when you go back to the shop and you start implementing the little changes, then the little changes make a difference. Um, I, I, that that became an addiction for me. I just I just loved it, and and I and I've done it on a daily basis. And one of the one of the one of the most valuable lessons that I learned on on the on the marketing course, the the guy, the guy that ran it, um, we had behavioural needs profiles done. All the students, there was about twelve students, and we had we all had uh, behavioural needs profiles done on us, like real behavioural needs. So you had this two hundred questions to fill in you to fill out so what he done was he took it away and got it analyzed and when he, when the when the um when the results came back he, he said does anybody mind if if we read these out in the in the class publicly no nah, nobody minds so he says right let's have a look you're that you're that gordon this is yours now what it says on the top here is you're argumentative i says no i'm not <laughs> and the woman the woman beside me goes no, it's just I was like, oh, fuck, really. So, um, so yeah, I, I just, I just loved that whole thing. What was I talking about before I, before I interrupted myself? Aye. So, um, <laughs> so the implementation of of all these things. One of the most valuable lessons that he taught me was um, he said, "How often do you walk into your shop?" I said, "Every day, every day in life, I walk into my shop." He said, "No." He said, you walk in the back shop every day in life and you pick up your tools and you start work. Yes, I do. He said, how often do you walk in the front door? I said, I never walk in the front door of my shop. He said, once a week, walk in the front door of your shop. And I did that every every week since that. Since that time, I did that every week. Because when you see things different, Mark, what you see is... You do. A light bulb out or there's a, a cracked tile... You see something that the customer sees. You, you see things that the customer sees, not things that you only see. That you, when you walk in the back shop and lift up your tools, you only see what you want to see. But when you walk in with with different eyes to the front of your shop, you see things differently. So I done that for uh, yeah. I done that for the, the rest of the time that I was uh, I was in the shop. So. Um, you should stand the on the other side of the range and listen. And, and, and see what you can actually hear as a customer because um, yeah. sometimes conversations that you think you're having privately with staff are being yeah. broadcast right into yeah. that yeah. customer area. And yeah. um, I've done that a few times. Mm. That's eye-opening. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> My, uh, yeah, so... There's a story I'll tell you another time. <laughs> <laughs> Offline. <laughs> yes. So, uh, absolutely. So yeah. So I at that point, the the shop was doing extremely well, and um, I thought it was time for a refit. So my uh, Dutch range was uh, quickly uh, replaced the the traditional one that we had, and um, we put an extension on the back. And uh, it just went from strength to strength. It was just, yeah, it was it was happy days. Um, then, so then the Townhead Calf was your second yeah. shop. Townhead Townhead was it was uh, it was an opportunity that I wanted to take. I, it's funny being in, regardless of how much you do in your in your dad's shop. It's always your dad's shop. Now uh, that yeah. was, and I wanted to do something for myself. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I want, and I wanted to grow. I never wanted to grow the business, and I didn't. I never wanted twenty shops. Really. I never, never wanted twenty shops. But a couple of, a couple of good, well-run shops. I would, uh, I would, I would have, and um, I saw this business for sale. The town head was a. Uh, it was always called the town head. It's in a prominent position in the, the borders town of Bigger, um, and it's a three-story uh, sandstone building. 
and it sits right at the top of the high street. So, and it's always been Townhead Cafe. Um, it was owned by an old woman um, who I'm sure is gone now. Um, but they ran it. They used to live up in the flats upstairs, and uh, they they would run the, the ice cream shop and the the cafe downstairs. But it was a minging shithole. It was an absolute shithole. <laughs> and, and I remember it came up for sale. And I read about it in the paper and I thought, Townhead Cafe up for sale, I'm going to go and see that. And I said to Sandra, I said, I fancy going up to Bigger for uh, for a look at the Townhead Cafe. She went, why do you want to look at Townhead Cafe? I said, it's up for sale. She went, you're not going to buy a cafe? I said, no, I'm going to obliterate it and turn it into a chip shop. She went, oh, what's wrong with the one you've got? I said, absolutely nothing. I love it. I said, but I just want another one. She went, mm. Right, okay then. So we've gone up and uh, we went in as customers and uh, and she ordered food. And I thought, fuck, I'm not having food in here. She ordered food. And then <laughs> after, after that, we came out and she went, and I said to her, what do you think? She went, oh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's very small. I said, but the building's huge. We're not talking about putting fish and chips in what you've just been in. I'm talking about, I had a vision and um, and I wanted that whole place stripped out and rebuilt. So um, so we made an appointment to go back and see it uh, officially. So we got back to see it, and the woman says, "Oh yeah, and you come and have a look at the back shop." And, and I saw her face; her face just fell as we walked in the back shop because she remembers two days ago that she'd eaten in there, you know, and wished, wished <laughs> she hadn't. So the whole God, place yeah. was shit on about. I wanted this shop and. Uh, so I'd done some market research on this job. We counted. When you do market research, you, you find out how many cars go by that, that business on a daily basis. Yeah. And you find out how many people are in the car. You find out the demographics of the people in the cars. So you can, with knowledge like that, you can cater for these people. So, so what I wanted was a, a, a fantastic fish and chip restaurant. Um, which is what we, which is what we built. We stripped it back to the stone, three-story building, stripped it back to the stone. Um, we had problems with the council. The council were a bit like my dad; they were not receptive to change. But I think that came from the the residents in that area as well. They're all quite fucking posh, you know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> so, so it took us a year. Uh, I remember getting the builders and it was the builders that we'd always used for all our work. And he and he came in and I said to him, when he get well, he started stripping out and he said, You haven't got new windows on the on the, the on the sheet. I said, Do we need new windows? He said, Do you need new windows? He says, Because the sashing case things are just falling to bits as I'm as I'm lifting the um the panels off the walls. I said, Well just change your windows and he said, Right, okay. I said, but make them look the same as what the sash and case ones did. So he tried to make them look the same as the sash and case, but PVC just, just doesn't look the same as, as sash and case. So we had all these uh, we had all these banners up as well on the outside of the building to let people know that we were coming. Um, because the accredit we, we brought accreditations from uh, from from Bell's Hill and uh, and and posted them up round the round the town just to let people know. Who we were, just so that was a, I can good operators. Yeah, it was a mild introduction to to who we were. We didn't just want to open up, and all of a sudden, the the two hundred year old Townhead Cafe had changed from selling scrambled egg and toast to fish and chips. You know, so we wanted to break that in gently, but it, it got it got so bad with the council that um, that the procurator fiscal got involved. And uh, I got a letter from the procurator of fiscal one day, one day, and I went, oh, for fuck's sake. And I knew the guy as well. I was a member of the Rotary Club of uh, Kirluk, and he was a member of the Rotary Club of Bigger. So we had met, and, and his name was Stuart. I can't remember his name. So um, so he sent me this letter, and I phoned him up, and I went, what the fuck? And he said, there's nothing I can do about it. We have to react whenever we get uh, complaints like that. I said, you're talking about... Posters that are going to come down as soon as we open. Yeah, just take them down and get your windows changed back. <laughs> oh, no. So we had we had new sash and case windows to buy as well. So the whole thing was, um, but but the whole project, Mark. The whole project again. I loved doing the project. I, I, I had an addiction to 
I was in there putting up lintels and and stripping out this and building that, and uh, I just I just loved the the whole uh, the whole experience. Um, the shop opened in uh, two thousand and six. We had entered fish and chip shop of the year in the in the Bell's Hill shop for a couple of years prior to that. Um, Townhead opened in two thousand six, and I th- did we enter both shops? I'm not sure if we entered both shops. I think we did actually. Maybe you weren't allowed. But anyway, um, so we had a fantastic restaurant restaurant upstairs. The the people that we were attracting in that shop. Um, Scottish borders are very famous for artists and uh, poets and stuff like that, you know. So people were coming in, I didn't even know who they were. But you got, um, you, you would get a, a, a letter delivered. There would be a beautiful poem written by some poet that had been in for fish and chips the, the week before, you know. And and again, the Lovely. shop, uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, it, was, it was uplifting. I just, the shop was... It was brand new, it was clean, it was exactly the way that, that uh, I had the vision in my head and uh, and I loved it, it was, uh, it was great. Uh, Sandra took care of the uh, training all the staff, she's great with people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, she's she's brilliant with customers and staff, she's great with stuff like that. I've, I've got very little patience for, for training up kind of stuff, I like training friars. No, no, <laughs> don't Kendall say that. Staff, Kendall staff have got very little patience. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, you know, <laughs> but it's true. No, and the, the, the funny thing was, the yeah. funny thing was, in that shop, in, in our shop in Bells Hill, we most of the, I would say ninety percent of the the counter staff were, were female, but in bigger, ninety percent of the counter staff were male. It, it was strange the way that that whole thing changed. I, I'm not sure who I preferred working with, um, but uh, I think I think the the bigger ones were easier to, easier to teach because we we had this brand new shop and they just wanted to be a part of it, you know, and uh, and we were happy to, happy to bring them in and and um, and train them up. So um, so obviously, like uh, we we were still doing the, the quality awards the. We also did uh, all all our staff were on um, training courses for for various things. It would always be customer service, or the friars would obviously be on on servers uh, on friar friar training. So we always got involved. The training was our, our big point, our, our strongest point. Obviously, with uh, investors and people uh, accreditation, we learned a lot from them as well. We learned about. Um, what did we learn for them? <laughs> no, <I'm looking. laughs> we learned about evaluation. How how important uh, evaluation was when you were when you done a training job. You done you done you, you train somebody. That if you're not going to evaluate, don't don't do the training. So when you train, you have got to evaluate. Or once you evaluate, does it need does it need uh, tweaked? Does it need done again? So you find these uh, you find these things out. So we were very very big on training. We almost won the. Uh, the training award almost won it. I think we came we came second a few times, but uh, but we never actually won the the training award. So yeah, we put the we put the shop in for uh, fish and chip shop of the year. Uh, two thousand would that be two thousand six? The entries would be for one in two thousand seven. Yeah. Yep, that's right. And yeah. you took my trophy. Yeah, we did, mate. I know we did. But <laughs> I was happy to follow you, mate. I was happy to follow you. I mean, just fish and chip shop of the year in the days was uh, a little bit different from what it is now. I think it's a little bit different from what it is now. I think it was more of a. It was a big thing. It was more of a, yeah, uh, but but it tended to be more of a, a good celebration. Uh, we've just been to fish and chip shop of the year uh, a few weeks ago. And one of the biggest things that I noticed on that, um, when Seafish run uh, the the competition, I, I loved I loved working with Seafish. I, I did all their uh, their assessments for their um, the, the quality award, uh, the Friars uh, train uh, customer services. I, I I loved doing all them. Um, 
I remember the first one I did. And you need to remember what I'm talking about, Mark, because I'll forget when it comes back to this. The first one I did, okay. Richard Richard Wardell was brilliant. I loved working with the guy. Yeah. And um Nice and guy. Me up. Really nice guy. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um and he was he was passionate and dedicated to his yeah. role within Seafish the way I was in my shop and I loved being part of that. And um I remember the first job he gave me was in was in Stornoway. I didn't even know where Stornoway was. It's on it's the capital of one of the one of the Scottish islands on the on the west coast. So he gave me this job to do. And they didn't tell you how to get there or anything like that. They just said, There's a there's an address, just go. So what you had to do was you had to find your own way there, then you would you would bill them for the for whatever the, the, the travel was. So I flew over to, to Stornoway and um, I got in a taxi. I come off the airport and I got in a taxi in the town centre to, to where the hotel was because I was, I was having an overnight. So um, when I arrived there, I thought, I better go and find out where this chip shop is so that I'm in there in the morning ready to go. So I've gone out into the town, walked around the town. I think there was two chip shops in the town, but neither one were the ones that, that I was looking for. And then, so I thought, oh, went into the um, tourist information centre and uh, the girl said to me, can I help you? I said, I'm looking for that chip shop. I can't remember the name of it. She went, I've never heard it. I said, it's a small, it's a small town. You must have, you must, uh, do you live here? You obviously don't commute. It's an island for Christ's sake. She went, aye, aye, but I've never heard of this chip shop. She said, have you got an address for it? And I said, aye, there's, I had to phone Richard Bordell and I said, Richard, check that address. So he gave me the address. Check the address. And I said, that's, that's the right, she, that's the right. She said, oh, do you get a car with you? I went, oh, no. She went, oh, you need to get a taxi then. So I got a, I got a taxi up to this. I gave the taxi driver the, the address and the person, I'm not even sure whether it was male or female, it was a Scottish island, so they all look the fucking same, to be honest. <laughs> so I've driven, we've driven up to this this place, and the, as we're driving up, the taxi driver's slowing down, and I thought, why is it slowing down? There's no village, there's no town. There was about four, I could see about four houses. So they stopped, at, the, the taxi stopped outside this house, and the, the, the blinds opened up, and I thought, well, this is it. So I've gone in, tapped the door, Girl opened the door, she went, said, Gordon, I said, aye. She said, then you come. I said, this right, is her house. So we're sitting, we're having a chat about fish and chips and the way they should be and stuff like that. So I thought at some point she's going to say to me, right, well, let's get in the car and go to the shop. But then she said, I better get ready and and we'll, we'll go into the into the shop. I said, right, okay then. So I'm putting a hat on the coat and I'm thinking, where the fuck's the shop? So we walked out our back door and into this caravan there was a caravan in our back door. Now, I could see four houses from where I was standing outside this caravan. And I thought, Richard Wardell is going to jump out at any time and say, surprise, it was an endurance test. <laughs> I thought it was an endurance test. It wasn't. It was an actual chip shop. And I couldn't believe how busy that caravan was. They took phone calls all day long and uh, and and sold fish and chips all day long. It was It was brilliant. So yeah, working with uh, working with uh, Richard and uh, in the days Jim Hyam was uh, was part of that whole sea fish thing as well. So I liked I liked doing things for them. Yeah, that's what we're talking about the the fish and chip. One of the things that I noticed about fish and chip shop of the year this year and for the last couple of years was that and it might be a small thing, but it, it, it's not really it's not a small thing to me. It's an observation that I made. Yeah, and I went and. A couple of years ago, I went and and you, they've got all your badges laid out, haven't they? So, yeah. Mark Petrie, Gordon Hallen, Nigel Hodgson, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's badges laid out. But when Seafish were running the, the competition, your badge would be laid out. Your badge and my badge would be a little bit bigger than everybody else's. And would have said on it, past winner. Past now, you winner go in yeah. Gordon, now you go in this Gordon Hallen. And I think, have, have you forgotten about us? Have you forgotten about? Us? Have, you, <laughs> have you forgotten what we brought to the table? Because I, I think in those days, Mark, we brought a lot to the table, especially around that, we did. that kind. Yeah, especially around that era where what, that we're talking about. You know, the Greg Howard, Nigel Hodgson, yourself, 
myself, Robert Smith, that kind of era brought a lot to the a lot a lot of information to the table, a lot of help. We moved the job so, on a bit in our own ways. We all we all won for a particular reason and we yeah. all we all moved the job on a little bit. I think yeah. I think my mouth <laughs> got me over the line. Um but Nigel's you, you a, a, very, a very particular yeah, well, I'd like to think so. I mean, it, we're talking about a time when the internet was really, you know, social media was only just finding yeah. its feet. And training was obviously a big part of, yeah. um, you know, w- w- what what you that made you a cut above the other finalists because yeah. you do have to have something to, to, to you know, and, and Nigel was such a particular operator and, Greg and Caroline were a formidable team. Caroline Howard brought just as much as Greg did to to yeah. their year, um, yeah. and you know, both hardworking people. And 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 again, you know, all of the winners moved the job on. Look at Atlantic. Yeah. Um, yeah. What what what, what um, Giovanni Fionda was doing with with. Um, with his online ordering and stuff, it was, I mean, it was epic revolutionary at the time. Uh, nowadays yeah. it's an everyday thing, but he was ahead of the curve. So yeah, yeah I'd agree with you. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, and I think in that era, that, in that era, the, the, the mold was kind of broken where um, you weren't keeping anything to yourself anymore. You're absolutely right. Training was, training was becoming a real big thing. And, um, and because of that, I was quite happy to, to write articles for magazines and and uh, go into shops and do a bit of training for them and share information. We've learned yeah. since since that time that information sharing is key. It, it raises the bar uh, on the, the whole industry. People learn. They learn from us. Their people learn from them. The bar gets raised every single time somebody, somebody learns something. Um, so I think the, the, the mould... Of, of the the silence has been broken, and we started talking about bar mixes. I remember the when I won fish and chip shop of the year. There was uh, obviously TV cameras there, and they they came up to us and and they said, "Can we do a little interview?" I said, "Yeah, of course." So um, one of the questions they asked was, uh, "What's the secret of your batter?" And I went, "There is no secret bar. This is a, is a proprietary bar mix in war." And they went. Everybody's got a secret bar mix. I said, nobody's got a fucking secret bar mix. That's just, <laughs> that's just an illusion. That's just something that everybody thinks. It's the way that you do it. It's not It's not what you put in it. It's the way that you do it. It's the way that you do everything. Yeah. And I said to them, it's a chain. It's, it's the, Your batter mix is part of a chain. It's the same as your oil. It's the same as your product that you buy. The way you treat your product, it's a chain. Everything's connected. You get one wrong everything's wrong. So um, I said, there are, there are no secret uh, secret bar mixes. Well, not for me anyway. There might have been for somebody else, but but not for me. There wasn't any secret bar mixes. So um, so winning Fish and Chip Shop of the Year was absolutely, absolutely tremendous for, for not only for, for me personally, for, well, for Sandra and I personally, but also for the, the business. The business, uh, the business just boomed a bit. Again, in, in those days, you had uh, you had regions. So we had already seen, because we got through the final 10, we had already seen a massive uh, upturn in, in business. You won Scotland, Europe. didn't you? We won Scotland, yeah, exactly. And and uh, the Scottish the Scottish newspapers and, and TV programmes were all over it. Um, we had... Uh, um, Uh, what do you call them? Uh, MPs. We had MPs and uh, MPs. MPs now straddle into your shop and say how fucking wonderful you were. And I said, well, where were you like four years ago when the council were hammering us for building the shop in the first place? <laughs> you know what I mean? They didn't want to know you in the days. But it's not until you did something good for you. And I remember, I remember David Mundell was the, was the Scottish Secretary at the time. And um, and he came in, and uh, he said, "I can't thank you enough for for putting such a boost into the area." And I thought, "Fuck's sake, you know, these guys. Uh, it's all about it's all about them." I think 
I think it is all about them, but I think you, you you can learn lessons from people like like politicians and stuff like that. That um, it is all about them, and it's never about you. If you do something good for them, they'll say well done. But it doesn't last for long. It doesn't last right. For long. So, I, so no, I've I've got to uh, I've got to pull you up on a couple of things because yeah. I think they're really important to this conversation. Um, one is um, going back to the fish and chip shop of the year competition. Um, yep. You you were starting to tell me um, how it how it had differed, and that you went a few weeks ago, but then you didn't finish telling me um, how you found the experience of going a few weeks ago compared to uh, what it was like back in the day. And also, we now we now have that Scottish that have got their own fish and chip awards, and I'm yeah, interested to see what you think about that because you won Scotland before you were crowned UK champion. You'd won that region. Well, now yeah. Scotland's got its own awards. So does I'm, I, just because I'm interested in your opinion, do you think that's, that's um, yeah. going to dilute things or? I'll answer, I'll answer that second question first, if that's all right. Um, Please. What the, you, what the, you like? the, the, the Scottish Chippy Awards I thought was a, was a great night. It, it was a, it was a great Me night. Me too. Well done. It was laid on by the the same guys that do the Italian awards and stuff like that. They are very very good marketeers. Um, the yeah. uh, the 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 trophies that they were given out were for the recipients of those trophies were very good, but for everybody good for else, business. just yeah, they were just. I, do you know what, Mark? I think. I think if if somebody says you're the best at something, it doesn't matter who they are or or why they've said it, you're always going to market that. If you don't, you're a fool. <laughs> Simple yeah. as that. If you don't market it, you're a fool. So it's good for it's good for people to get uh, to get a little lift now and again and get a little bit of recognition for what they yeah. for what they're doing in their in their own in their own businesses. Um, so. The, the night itself was uh, was very enjoyable. I enjoyed the night. Um, it was loud. Hard. <laughs> well, do you know what I didn't enjoy? It, it was wet. I'm going and, 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 and to be perfectly perfectly honest here. What I didn't enjoy about it was the fact that they were celebrating fish and chips. That was the Scottish Chippy Awards. Now that's what they that's yeah. what they were there for. They weren't there for pizza. They weren't there for kebab and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The Scottish Chippy Awards, right? So I'm there. You were there. We are fish and chip yeah. legends, and they never even said hi. How you doing? Are we? We never <laughs> even get. We never get a free drink. We never get a mention. Uh, and I think. And I think that's. Wrong. I lo- I- I, I, do, I, I love being cool. anonymous. <laughs> nah, well, <laughs> being a, well, I don't mind that. I, I don't mind. I don't mind being a little bit anonymous as well, Mark. But at the same time, you're in a room full of people that are that would love to have uh, achieved what what you uh, achieved in the fish and chip industry, and uh, and they can't even say, "Hi, Mark, how you doing? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming." Do you know? And I thought that the, 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 are, are they unaware? And if they are unaware... No, I was okay it. with that. No, but if they are unaware, then they haven't done their homework on the whole fish and chip industry, which is what they are supposed to be representing at that, uh, at that Agree. award. So I think I they need to do a little bit more homework. Um, their judging yeah. process needs to be a little more transparent, but then that's not... A bit more robust. That's not any different from the, uh, the, the judging process that we're now talking about for for National Fish and Chip Awards. I think that needs a little bit more transparency as well. Um, yeah. I'll be back in the day when, when when I was winning, when you were winning, etc. And then after you had won, Nicky Hawkins and uh, Andy Gray would ask you to become a, a judge for the, the competition. So the transparency yeah. of the whole thing was brilliant because it wasn't just you that judged that shop or me that judged that shop. There was probably three judges going in that shop. And then at the end of that, there was a team of judges that had to uh, assess you as a person to see if you were um, if you were good enough to to get the title of Fish and Chip Shop of the Year. And again, working with uh, 
with Nicky Hawkins and, and Andy Gray. I loved doing that. I loved I loved the mistakes that Nicky used to make when she sent you to somebody's house instead of the shop. You know, you'd be sneaking into somebody's house with uh, <coughs> with a, a hat Clip and a board. coat on. I'm here. I'm here to do your fish yeah. and chip job. Fish and chip shop of the year award, Judge. Oh my god. So many times that happened is unbelievable. But I mean, remember phoning her one day and I'm go- I'm gonna it. I'm going to get Nicky Hawkins on this podcast. I'm going to try really, really <laughs> hard. That's good. To, that, that's going to try good really, really hard. I love her a bit. She's, yeah. she's brilliant. Yeah, I, she's brilliant. I've always, I've always, amazing woman. Brilliant with her. Amazing woman. Uh, I've got yeah. a lot of time. If, if she, even now, if she asked me to do anything, it'd be like, yes, Nicky. <laughs> Straight away. Yeah. You know, I, um, because she was the matriarch and, and she transformed my life really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I've always felt a, um, a, a fierce sense of loyalty and gratitude. And, yeah. and to Andy Gray, who, again, yeah. is a smashing guy. Smashing guy. Yeah. No, yeah. totally agree. Couldn't so, agree more. So um, what – the impact of winning, what – I mean, it, it was it, it was epic for you. Um, how long did you ride that for? Was that – that was that was great, wasn't it, winning? I'm still riding it. Me. Did the <laughs> – <laughs> is it it it, it 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 is a life changing thing, isn't it? When you when Absolutely. you, um, I, when you... I, I'm I'm still reading I'm still reading that with Yeah. Well um this year's yeah. winner, Ryan. Um yeah. I, I I trained I trained him through Karemco um before he'd got his own shop. I've got pictures of him, he looks so young and yeah. back then I looked bloody old, you know. But um Ryan has been on my radar for a long time. He's such a deserving winner this yeah. year because he's he's pushed water up a hill with a fork to get his yeah. business to where it is. And the, the you know I, I I really think he's such a deserving um, you know a safe pair of hands for this title because he has got batter in his veins. You know I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, you know, he's a real grafter. Yeah, I've so, seen that um, firsthand as well because I've uh, I've done judging in the crispy cod, which is where he used to yeah, work. He used that's to work. where I that's where I met so him. Their their working practice. I remember doing judging in there. Oh, I can't remember how many years ago it was now, but it was a long time ago. But their working practices in there were absolutely fantastic. Their working practices yeah, were brilliant, yeah. and, and Ryan worked in there at the time. The, actually, the day I went there. Um, his boss at the time set the range on fire, and I had to put it out. But <laughs> so that wasn't a good day for them. But I think, <laughs> but um, that's the first time and last time that's ever happened to me on, on a on a training job. Um, but uh, you know, I did that on a training what? job once. I did that on a training job once. <laughs> I was in the I was in the north of Scotland, and uh, it was just when I, I just started work for KFE, and electric ranges were not something that. I had ever really encountered. You get a little bit of training on them, but not not a lot. So I knew everything there was to know about the gas range, but electric range is not so much. But the guy that we were, we were changing the range for, he had an old electric range in there uh, that we were changing, and um, so I'm filling up the. Um, I said to him, "What what is it you want?" I nearly said his name there, but I better not. I better not say his don't, name. Just don't do it. I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave you. I'll leave you. You know who you are. So um, yeah. why is he hiding? It should be me that's fucking hiding. It was me that set his range of fire. But anyway, <laughs> so he said, put oil in the uh, fish pan, uh, oil in the two fish pans, and beef dripping in the in the chip pan. And I went, why? Did, why do you change that? He said, because everybody knows that beef dripping is the best medium you can get for frying chips. I went, all right, okay then. So that's fine. So I'm taking the base plate out to expose the the electrical element. Element. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking this out so I can put the the block of fat on the the top of the element. And he went, no, no, he says, that's not the way we work. He said, just throw it on the top. And I went, all right, okay. Because that's what he had before. But it, but what he had before was the element was underneath the pan. So then the element had to heat the pan before it heated the oil. But now you've got an element straight in the pan. So I put this block in the, a block of uh, beef dripping on the, the top of this base plate. 
And I'm talking away to him and his wife, and all the time I'm talking, I'm thinking, that, that's not right. That, it's niggling at my mind. There's something not right with that. And then the whole fucking thing just, the whole pan just burst into flames. I went, Jesus Christ. Woof. He was running about like a headless chicken. She was having a meltdown, and I switched the range off, put the lid on, and I put a fire blanket over it, and I said, I'm showing you the barbecue option. It <laughs> might, not be a, might, not be, might not be the best thing for you to try. I said, oh, he was, my new range, my new range. But you know what, Mark? I took the beef dripping out, gave it a wipe round. It was absolutely fine. So, yeah, I've, 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 I have set somebody's range on fire. I've never set my own range on fire, ever. Yeah. And, I've never done, and I've never done it since. That one time right. it was a bloody electric range, and I've still got a fear about electric ranges. When somebody wants to buy an I electric it. range, I say, "Do you know how to work it?" <laughs> because <laughs> because I don't. <laughs> I do actually. I've learned since then. Um, so, what was the question? Coming back to <laughs> um, your experience at the Fish and Chip Awards this year compared to before, yeah. you've, you answered the same um, question. I just think that um, I just think it's not celebrated enough, Mark. Uh, I know there was a lot of people there, um, but I felt as if, yeah, Ryan won and he was up there, and he got a good clap, a standing ovation, brilliant. But it wasn't the same. There wasn't the same passion. That I don't know whether it was because maybe I was when I was entering fish and chip shop of the year, you got a bit more involved. Um, and obviously when I won, I was really involved. But And, and then the, the years after that, the, the, the short years after that, um, there seemed to be a lot more passion. There didn't seem to be that ignition, you know what I mean? Uh, there didn't seem to be that recognition that is, is, is worthy of a, a fish and chip shop of yeah. the year winner. I just don't, don't think that there was that the same height, I don't know. I might be wrong. Maybe maybe people that are 30 years younger than me are sitting thinking, oh, it was brilliant and all the rest of it, but I don't know. Um, I, I, so, I think I, I, I think there's there's um there'll be people that will agree with that, that um that 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 it wasn't in the room that day. Um I I um I would I would say that there's there's always room for improvements. There were lots of things yeah. that they did right on the day. Um, and I don't think you'll be the only one that thought that um, as well. But you know what? People can make comments uh, about this podcast and, and, and say that they agree with you. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of people that do. Um, I, I, I like to see the big one really hyped up and, and, yeah, to, make it, and to make a I big do. deal of it. They're going to be the voice for the industry for the next 12 exactly. months. And they, exactly. and they deserve, the they deserve to be, business. yeah, Absolutely. give them, give them that. And, um, but you know, um, on, on the whole, I think, um, I, I think it's always going to be one of those things that we can, we can always look to improve year on yeah. year. And it's, um, I, I said before in a previous previous podcast that I don't think has gone out yet that um, I think we need to stop pushing the negatives and the political agendas that, that, and we should celebrate, use this as a, as a way to celebrate fish and chips because yes. people know prices have gone up. We don't yeah, need to, to hang on about that. that. Whole, yeah. I'm fed up here in that whole uh, bleating on about uh, the price of this, the price of that. And you're and right. what we need is positivity. Get the positivity yes. back. And and Winston Churchill, we didn't win the fucking war. Fish and chips didn't win the war. It was the poor guys in the trenches that won the war, not not fish and chips. So is Winston Ch- Churchill necessary for fish and chips eight years later? <sighs> I, I don't. It was entertaining, but I don't think it was. Uh, I, I think we need to move on away from that that whole negative thing. We are we are an industry. Don't get me wrong. The the National Federation of Fish Fryers as 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 an organisation, I was always a member of. I always paid my subscription um, until I won. Well, I actually did when I won Fish and Chip Shop of the Year. I remember. I remember uh, standing at the bar at the cafe dinner dance. Uh, which was the week after that. I was in January in the days. And um, and Reese Head came up and he said, uh, would you like to write a, a monthly article for the, the magazine? And I went, uh, yep. And he 
kind of went, okay, so I was doing articles, I was doing articles, I was doing uh, columns and stuff like that. But, but I loved it, I loved doing it. So I said to Reese, um I said, I will on one condition. He said, what is that? I said, when I write it, you print it. You don't question it, you just print it. And he went, mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, because he knows that sometimes I swear. I don't swear a lot. I do swear a lot. Um, <laughs> you do swear a lot. But it's, you know, for the right reasons. Yeah, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not abuse of swearing. It's just, it's, it's passion. I'm putting passion. passion anyway. uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm Scottish. Scottish people tend to swear more than English people. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> So anyway, you do it to get Reece, warm, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so Reese said, yeah, that's fine. And um, at that time, uh, you'll probably remember, Mark, that uh, the National Federation of Fish Friars was divided. They had two, yeah. they had a president and an acting president, but they didn't speak to each other. So they had two, yeah. there, there were two different camps. They actually had, in fact, you and I went to a meeting. You and I went to a meeting. I remember you and I went to a meeting. So you were the previous winner, I was the current winner, and they invited us along, and um, they said they wanted me to join the board. That's what the, that's what that's why that means. And, and they want and they wanted to kick me out. They said, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they didn't get either. <laughs> so <laughs> they said, they said, God, we join the board, and I said, I need to see what what the what the board consists of first because. Although I pay my sus- subscription every year, and I was a believer in the, and I think the National Federation of Fish Friars do the the best job they can do on the limited resources that they've got because agree, agree. There's there's nine nine thousand fish and chip shops in this in this country, maybe a thousand pay into. I don't know whether it's a thousand or two thousand, but it's not nine thousand. I think nine thousand fish and chip shops should be paying into the National Federation of Fish Friars one hundred percent because they want. Because they want the um, the hype that they give them, they want the information that they that they can gather. They want that, but they want it for nothing. You know, pay yeah. your money, pay your money. If I was the federation, Great. I would be keeping everything closed doors. I wouldn't be telling anyone. See, you don't pay your money, you don't get any information. That's it in a nutshell. So, um, so where was I? You fucking made me forget what I was going to say. Aye. <laughs> so we're at this meeting. We're at this meeting in the in uh, Federation House, and um, it was disclosed that we could either go to that meeting or we could go to that meeting. What's the difference? Well, we don't speak to them, so because we don't speak to them, they don't agree with us. So what they do is they have so the board was divided, and they were having two meetings every month. I thought that's going to cost money, you know. So I challenged that, and I started looking at I started looking at what the the whole judging process for the the federation was, and uh, and I didn't like what I saw, and I thought I'm going to write an article, and I wrote an article, and I sent it on to Reese, and he phoned me up. I used to send emails. I was my start in the emails, so yeah. I would be bump 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 email. It took me about three fucking days to write an email to Reese, you know, and sent it, and. Um, and I would always phone him and say, did you get that email? Sandra said to me, why don't you phone people and ask if you got an email? And of course they go, I'm just checking because he's not answered. It was only, it was only said two minutes ago. But I've moved on since then. I wait, I wait a day before I phone somebody after I send an email. <laughs> so he phoned me up and he said, I can't print it, Gordon. I said, you can't print what? He said, the article you sent me, I can't print it. I said, why? He went, it is raw about the National Federation of Fish Friars. I said, Reese, they need a shake-up. I need to. Sh- I'm in a position where I've got a voice this year, and I need to be able to. I can shake them up, so I can. I can do that. And he went. I'll phone you back. So what he done was he phoned the likes of Pete Hill, he phoned Briar Wilkinson, he phoned Bill Colbeck, and all the all the sort of prominent ones that were in the the industry at that time, and asked for feedback. He said, "Listen, Gordon Hillens just sent me this. I want you to read it, and and if you approve it, then I, I'll print it. But if you don't." <laughs> so Pete Hill from that day to to Pete passed bless him every time I saw him he went remember that article you wrote about the Federation Gordon that was the best thing that ever happened because it really gave them a shake up they needed a shake up Mark it wasn't fair it wasn't yeah. fair on them but it wasn't fair on us as an industry either because they were struggling with, with each other 
you know, when when you have a fallout, regardless of who it's with, with, with your wife, your brother, your sister, your mum, your dad, it doesn't matter who you fall out with, there's always a way back. But at that time, for these guys, there was no way back. There was The, yeah. the hatred was just snowballing into something massive that, that I didn't like. So... Um, so I thought, right, I've, I've I've exposed it. Now I need to do something about it because you can't just expose something and, and leave it there. So I phoned John Rutherford, who was the exec, chief executive of uh, Seafish. Seafish. Brilliant guy. Yep. Loved him a bits. Phoned John Rutherford. And um, I said, John, is there anything you can do to help? He went, oh, yes. He said, what would you like me to do? I said, I don't know. I said, I don't know. I don't know where to go from here. I said, obviously I'm taking pelters from... Uh, an element of uh, people in the trade but then there's another element of the trade that are saying brilliant that needed said so John said yeah. you you give me a, a an invitation list of anybody that you'd like to attend a meeting he said we'll have a we'll set up a meeting in our Grimsby office and we'll get uh, professional uh, guys in there to coordinate that that meeting so they they would mediate they had mediators in they professional mediators. They brought professional mediators, and I don't know if I we all met in this uh, in this sea fish uh, place in in Grimsby, and um, the mediators were taking notes and, and running the this, this sort of thing. And the federation was one of the half was sitting over here, the other half was sitting over here, and they were shouting names at each other. <laughs> there was nothing more to be said. There was nothing more to be said. That there it is in a nutshell. And I was sitting beside Bill Colbeck and um and Bill said as the meeting was going on and they started talking about uh votes, how many votes everybody had. So this guy had a hundred and twenty votes, but this guy only had ten votes. And Bill Bill Colbeck said, What do you mean only ten votes and this is hundred and twenty votes? Well, he's got hundred and twenty members, so it's hundred and twenty votes. This guy has got 120 members so he can get 120 votes. So in actual fact, he's got more votes than everybody else. So it doesn't matter what everybody else says. This one uh, executive councillor can make the decision for the whole board. Yeah, that's right. And Bill went, no, no. He says, that is not happening. Bill Colbeck is one of the strongest supporters of the National Federation of Fish Fryers I've ever met. Yep. And and uh, he immediately challenged that. He said, that needs to change. So changes came about, and and I spoke to I spoke to Andrew Crook about this maybe a couple of years ago, and we were having a we we're having a beer, <laughs> strangely enough. Yeah. And um, and he said to me, he said, "God, remember that?" And I said, "I do." And he went, "That needed said." So I, I remember, I remember who the two people were, and and Bill Crook, Andrew's dad, actually yes. rose out of. He was the phoenix from the flames. He rose out of that and actually got the federation back into really good shape. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, Andrew's correct. dad, I loved I loved Bill. Although, although yeah. Bill, I've got a letter from Bill asking me to step down from the EC. Yeah. Um, but there must have been a reason I, for that, Mark. You don't get us to step down for nothing. Uh, yeah, it's because I own Chippy Chat and, and they yeah. felt threatened by it. But that it's all in the past. I loved Bill. Uh, Bill Crook was an amazing president. Um, yeah. And um, and I've got a really good relationship with Andrew, but I remember I remember it going on. I just didn't realise that you played such a pivotal role in getting that resolved. That's big. Um, oh yeah, I had oh, no yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. No, I wrote a, I wrote a damn article. It was uh, and it, and and it was it was quite uh, the wording in it was quite brutal. That's why uh, that's why Reese didn't want to didn't want to print it. It was the wording. He said, "Can you reword that?" I said, "No." Nah. It's got to have that boom, that impact. I just wanted it to have that impact, which it did. And um, yeah, Andrew and I have spoke about it since. And uh, yeah, all good. So it needed sorted so- out. So we sorted it out. Um, right. So would you now, have a question for me? <laughs> I, do, I, I do. I, I do. Um, after the win, you obviously yep. enjoyed a, a like a golden patch <laughs> um, at, at the Townhead Calf. Um but now you're actually you're actually away from fish and chips on the front line on the coal face, and you're working at KFE. Talk yeah. me through, talk me through how how you went how from that, being a front how line. That came about. Um, yeah, I had always I had always worked for uh, KFE. I bought 
I probably bought about five ranges from KFE as a as a customer for for different shops. Two in that shop, one in that shop, another one in that shop. So I had a I had a very good relationship with uh, with KFE at the time anyway, um, and I did uh, I did on site training for them. So when they put a new range into into Scotland, they would often phone me up and ask me to go to go and do the training for it. Uh, which I was happy to do. I did that too. Yeah, I, I did was that too. I was happy to do that. I, 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 again, going back to the the whole training thing, I just loved it. I, I didn't just go in and show them how to work a range. I would go in and spend the whole day. You would be showing them how to mix butter and how to cut fucking chips and God knows what all. You know how to do their dry weight. Kind of what we do already. I mean, uh, now at the, the training school, so but but I loved it, and um, and they were good because you were well. a, a previous. You're a previous winner as well. Having having somebody like you come into your yeah. shop um, on day one would, must have been a yeah. real a, a real treat for for new shop owners or new yeah. starts to have such an yeah. a, a, an esteemed person yeah. going yeah. in. But and they pay. They you're right. They did pay well as well. They did pay well. Like, well, they used to pay well. I'm not so good at fucking paying now. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you take that up with Paul at the bar. <laughs> So yeah, so I've always I've always been kind of integrated into the whole uh, KFE family. Uh, yeah. Paul and Arvo Williams, and, it, and it is a family, absolutely. Yeah. Right. But it's, it, it, when when they say it's a family, they, they're not talking about Paul, Avi, Nick, and Tanya, and and Matt. They're talking about the extended family. There, what they're yes. saying is, yes. when you when you're coming into the fold, you're part of the family. You're part of the family. You're you're now part of the family. You're in the whole the whole family. So it's not family as in blood relation. It's no. it's an extended family. So and and I like being part of that. Um, Me too. I love it. So Paul and Avril Williams have been very close friends of uh, Sandra and I for for many years before I started work for KFE, uh, as were uh, Bill and Jean Shaw. Yeah, um, I'd love Bill the on the podcast. Time, the but... time, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, I'll tell you a story. The first time I met Bill Shaw, the first time I met Bill Shaw, he didn't sell me my first ranges. I bought them off a guy. I can't even remember the guy's name. He was working for KFE. He was represented Scotland at, at that time, and uh, I remember I remember phoning them up and uh, asking them to come in and and have a look and see. I'd be changing this uh, new Preston and Thomas range that my dad had bought with the. Uh, Burgundy for Micah on the front. Um, don't get me wrong, Mark. It done a job. It did the job. But I just, I just wanted what I wanted. So this guy came in and uh, measured up for a range, and um, it was a four pan, a four pan uh, counter range that I bought. And then I thought, well, we're getting busier and busier all the time. So we're having a full refit. So why don't I put a two pan back up? I've got room in the shop. The shop was huge. We built a massive extension. So I thought I'm going to put a two pound back up on the on the back wall. So I phoned this guy back and he came back out and he said, "Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, no problem." Um, do you want to order? I said, "Yeah." So we ordered the ranges, and the ranges duly went in, and uh, we started working on them. And maybe about a week after that, it was a Monday night. I always took a Monday off work. On Monday night, I always took always took a Monday night off work. So I'm home. And and my my phone went and uh, it was a strange number. I answered the phone. Hello, hi Gordon. Yeah, this is Bill Shaw. And I went, Bill Shaw. Oh, I said Kefi. Yes. Um, he said I'm coming up to see your shop. Is that okay? I said absolutely fine. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, quite happy to meet you there. He said right. He said I'll be there in about an hour and a half. I went ah. Oh. I said it's Monday. He went. And the problem there is, I said, well, Monday's my night off. And he went, okay. He said, how far away from the shop do you live? I went, no, 40 minutes. He went, right, okay. He said, I'm six hours away from your shop. He said, and I can drive up. He said, can you not come down and meet me? And I went, I found myself going, yeah, no problem. And Sandra went, where are you going? I said, I'm going to meet Bill Shaw. And she went, it's Monday, I went, I know, but he's just fucking instructed me to be there. So I need to be there. I didn't know this guy at all. And that was the first time. And I actually told Bill that story. He had forgotten that. I've, I spoke to him recently, and he had yeah. forgotten that. Um, and that was uh, that was the first time I met him. Paul and Avril I've known for many years. 
So that's not answering your question. Um, the answer to your question is um, in 2000 and end of 2008, I noticed that there was imperfections in the Bells Hill shop based on the, what the bigger shop was doing. Yeah. So I thought if I if I took that range out there and put a put a new one in, just all in one line, and we change the way the shop works, I can save on uh, on staff costs, and I can save on gas, electricity. It was all about the saving me, but it was all about it's all about evolution as well, Mark. I just want to yeah. evolve. I, I want to reinvent myself on a regular basis, and um, it, it doesn't matter what it is. You, you've got to you've got to reinvent yourself. Uh, on a regular basis, yeah. so the shop hadn't been the shop hadn't really been touched for a few years. So I thought, right, let's get the shop done up because the money was rolling in. It was happy days. We weren't. I mean, the, 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 we weren't rich or anything like that. But the, there was there was a good there was a good flow of uh, flow of money coming in, and all the bank loans were getting paid, and the suppliers were all getting paid. So it was happy days. So. Um, I started looking at the Bells Hill shop based on what we had done in, uh, in Bigger and uh, came up with a new plan. So we're going to get the shop refit, but I had to borrow a quarter million quid. And that was in 2008. So I borrowed... Now, bearing in mind that uh, the Bigger shop, the shop in Bigger, from start to finish, that shop, buying the property, the refit, etc., etc., Six hundred and fifty thousand quid. So that was a yeah. big investment, but the banks are happy to lend. The banks are happy to lend. Yeah. So as time goes on, you obviously you're paying your you're paying your way, and um, and your shop's getting busier. So you're you're making money, but you're also gaining uh, equity on the on the shops. Yeah, as you're knocking so, your loan down. Yeah, your your loan to valuation is going down and down. So everything's are you are going up, I should say. So yeah. you're you're in a better position. So I went back to the bank with a new proposal, and bear in mind, we spoke about it before. I'm great at proposals, and uh, yeah. and my uh, uh, MICB accreditation let me do uh, sums, so I can do projections. So I knew how to do yeah. all that. So I had all the projections, the savings that I was going to make with the refit. Okay, yeah, the refit's going to cost, but it's going to save this. Blah blah blah. Did what you do? So I took this proposal to the bank. Bank looked at it and went. Brilliant. How much do you need? I said 250 grand. 250 grand, right, okay. So 250 grand was in my account very quickly. And uh, and we refit the shop. Start of 2009 was uh, a global financial crash. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I struggled same, massively. Yeah. And the same bank... The same bank who had, I mean, the paint wasn't dry on the on the extension yet, and the same bank came back and said, "We need that money back." And I said, "You'll get it back in ten years, as arranged." And um, they put a bit of pressure on, so um, my working capital had gone down. So I was getting to a point where uh, they weren't on. Do you know what they done? They 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 fucking. See when, see when, see when you got a global financial crash, the banks yeah. for some reason are allowed to write down the value of your property by thirty percent. So when they write, they down do the it value anyway. Your, when they yeah. write down the value of your property by thirty percent, it puts you in a negative equity situation. When you're in a negative equity situation, they can increase your bank the the interest on the the bank loans, and that's exactly what they did. So they increased the interest on the bank loans. They insisted on uh, monthly management accounts. And I'm not going to bleat on about them, Mark. You've asked me the question, so I'm, I'm answering it as quickly as I can because it's such a negative uh, area of my life that I'm, really, I'm, I'm at peace with it now. They're, they're yeah. a, can I say? No, I'm not even going to say that word um, because I know that English people will get offended. Yeah. Um, Don't say it. No. We all know. <laughs> Yeah, um, but it's probably a lesson that that I didn't learn early in life was not to trust certain people. I yeah. was always a very trusting people. I, I like dealing with these people, you know, and um, and and they they were very supportive. But they're only supportive when things are going well for them. And as soon as as soon as the table turns slightly, they they just want to 
grew your left right and center, and that is exactly what they did. To so, me. and it, uh, they, they, let they, me they let me, me a, put a. You go. Sorry, they got me at a, a very vulnerable time as well because we had um, we had multiple bereavements in the in the family at that time. Sandra's half of Sandra's family were wiped out by illness, uh, death through illness. You know, it was heart attacks, cancers. Our brother died at the age of 49, for Christ's sake, you know? And um, so we wow. were at a very vulnerable time. And regardless of what you think, you shouldn't mix business with, 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 with your personal life. Of course you do. You, you, can't, you can't help it. So, um, so it got to a point where uh, I said, you know what, fuck it. And um, at that point... Uh, Paul Williams had just set up the KFE School of uh, Fine Excellence and uh, he phoned me up and said, uh, can you can you help run the, the School of Fine Excellence? And I said, I, I had written a, an article a couple of years previous. Um, I phoned Paul and asked if it was all right um, because they when they bought their new premises, when KFE bought their new premises in the Market Deepen, um, yeah. it, it was a warehouse and they put a working range in the warehouse, which was a brilliant idea. What Paul was trying to do was bring people in to uh, try before you buy. I think that was their, their kind of logo at the time, try before you buy. But I said to him at the time, I said, is that only for uh, for KFE customers or can anybody use it? He went, I don't know why MD can't use it. So I said, you're quite happy for somebody to come in, play on your range, learn how to fry chips, but they're not going to buy a range off you. He went, absolutely. He said, because it's all for the betterment of the industry. It's all for the good of the trade. And, and yeah. a couple of years after that, he uh, he launched uh, the KFE School of Fine Excellence. Um, he got Nigel Hodgson uh, to help him write the um, the manual, the manual for that. And I'll, I'll never forget the first the first one we did. I didn't know Nigel well at the time, and um, so I'm just meeting him, and and I'm down there, and he gives me this manual. And I said, right, what do we do with the manual? And he said, we just read it. And I went, all right, okay, then that, that's fine. I said, well, we, we read it and learn it. No, no, no. We get students in and we read it out to them. I went, really? He went, yep. So Bill Shaw and Avril Williams were the first two uh, attendees to the School of Fine Excellence. And I said, we're going to read this. Yeah, we're going to read it. Word for word, yeah, we're going to read it word for word. Oh, fucking word. So I've started reading, and you know when you're reading, you're going, uh, the, the, and you're not looking at anybody in the face, you're reading. And I looked up, and Bill's going, <sighs> bored. I says, is this, is this boring for you, Bill? And he went, yeah. After all, went, ah, it's boring, Gordon. I said, look, I said, why don't we just do topics? I said, we'll, we'll throw the books away, we'll do topics. So oil management, yeah, I can speak about oil management. So all of a sudden it was it was a lot better, you know, because you're not you're not <laughs> reading anything out of, out of a book. It's not it's not scripted. Um so I was quite happy to take on that role as you were yourself. So there was the three of us, you, me yeah. and Nigel, all running the the KFE School of Fine Excellence. And um at that point the uh the the bank were putting big pressure on, and they had they were they're, they're sneaky bastards, and they yeah. Uh, yeah they they say because you're vulnerable, and they say right, okay, we'll put you in touch with this guy. I know a guy who might be able to help, so I'll put you in touch with this guy. But this guy actually fucking works for them. Do you know what I mean? And I didn't know that yeah. until long after. And um, and I actually reported them to the Financial Conducts Authority. It was a, and it was it's funny. It was Andrew Bailey was the the head of the Financial Conducts Authority at that time. He's now the governor of the Bank of England. Bank of England. I remember England. emailing yeah. him. Yeah, I remember emailing him. I, I got his direct email and I emailed him. It was a Sunday morning, and I emailed him with a whole catalogue of events. And he got back to me on the Sunday. Andrew Bailey himself got back to me on the Sunday and he went, you should never have been treated like that by a, a financial institution. Um, yeah. And it, it went as far as uh, it went as far as MPs and stuff like that, but it got to a point, Mark, where you look at the likes of uh, Noel Edmonds taking banks to court, he's, he's spent millions on, yeah. uh, on lawyer's fees, millions, and he's never won his case. And he's got as much time, he's got, more, he's got all the time in the world and, and all the money in the world to pay. And 
I'm there. I don't not get two fucking pennies to rub together. I'm back to where I was when I was seven years old, you know, financially. Um, so so let, um, let let me just clar let me just clarify this. You were on. You were paying for everything. You were absolutely I, 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 do, behaving I, I, absolutely impeccably, haven't. but the bank absolutely got haven't. into trouble because of the financial Correct. crisis. And the bank, the bank decided to move the goalposts and recall a loan that you Correct. were happily paying, that you yep. demonstrated you could pay. And Correct. so the bank pulled the plug on you when you'd done nothing wrong. And, and I've always said that banks will give you an umbrella when it's sunny and they'll yeah. take it away when it rains. Absolutely. It was the banks, the, the banks that got into trouble and they yeah. ha read the small print listener because banks can do that. You can be on top of your payments. Yeah. You can be, you yeah. can be, uh, uh, and they can still pull the plug. They've got Absolutely. the right to do it. Absolutely. I don't like banks. I use my I own don't. money now, but it took me 37 yeah. years to get to a point where I don't need banks anymore. Um, during the during the uh, pandemic, there I don't know if you remember uh, one of uh, Boris Johnson. It might have been Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak. I'm not sure which. But in one of the speeches that they made, they said, "We are supporting individuals now. We're supporting businesses now, which is what we should have done in 2009. Instead of that, we supported yeah. banks. They supported banks. The the banks were getting." The banks were getting millions and millions of pounds from uh, yeah. from government funding and not spending. I think the the government thing. still owns a lot of RBS, doesn't it? Well, even I wasn't today. with RBS. I wasn't even with RBS. You were, you with, were you with an, an Irish uh, bank? Allied Is Irish. Allied Irish yeah. Bank. Allied Irish Bank were the best bank I've ever, I've ever had. Um, I had multiple banks, but Allied Irish were the best because they they had a business team. And you could go and sit with their business team and speak about projections and stuff like that. And they knew they could they could tune into exactly what, what you needed. They, they, they were willing to support that whole thing as well. So if there was flaws in that, they would help you with it. So bear in mind that, um, that probably seven, eight, nine months previous to them pulling the plug on me, they just lent me an extra 250,000 quid. So... They're not going to give me that yeah. 250,000 quid if I've got anything bad against my name, anything at all. If I hadn't no. met payments, they're not. And if the projections didn't stack up. So all those things were stacking up. But it's still, they're still allowed to uh, reduce the, the value of your business. Legally, allowed to just reduce the value of business by 30% in a, in a financial crisis. And um, wow. yeah, I never thought that was right. But anyway, um, upward and onward. Um, yeah, I'm finished you ended in the up chip. KFE. I'm finished in the chip shop, and I went in at Paul's office one day, and I said, "You might have me full time, Paul." And he went, "Excuse me," I said, "I might actually be looking for a job," and he went, "And I said it might be your lucky day." Not <laughs> like I didn't really see that. <laughs> I didn't really see that, but um, but we spoke, and uh, he was quite happy to give me the position to look after his uh, customers and. In Scotland, I'd never sold a range in my life. I'd bought plenty, but I'd never sold a range in my life. And I like to think sometimes that I still don't sell ranges, but people buy them from me. You know, um, yeah. I can, I can, I can go and see people, and I can tell them the way I see their business. Um, I can advise them. I can give them lots of advice. Um, and it's well, it's been a great thing cool. working for KFE. The, the 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 biggest problem start starting to work for KFE was the fact that I had to sit in a car for hours on end. And I would, I'd, I'd be sitting in, in a car for maybe... That was a culture shock for me because I was always used to being on my feet walking about, so you didn't put yeah. weight on. But see when, you start, see, when you start sitting in cars, you started you start putting weight on. And I remember... I, I, you probably noticed at some point that uh, I've got a bit of a hearing defect. So I don't hear very well. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I noticed that... I noticed that a few years ago because Sandra's saying, oh, that tail is awfully loud, you know, so then you start questioning yourself, saying this. So I've gone to the doctors and um, I said to the doctor, I think I've got a hearing problem. The doctor said, can you describe the symptoms? I said, aye, Homer's a fat dude and Mo uh, Marjorie's got blue hair. And um, <laughs> at that point, I knew that there was a, there was a, there was a problem with the hearing. 
So anyway, so I'm putting a bit of weight on driving about in the, the KFE car and uh, not doing very much uh, activity. So I've gone to my, my daughter's a fitness uh, fanatic, my youngest. She's a fitness fanatic and she goes to the gym every day. And I said to her, look, I'm putting this, I'm putting this bit of a belly on because of all the rubbish that I'm eating and uh, not doing it, doing some uh, physical work. She said, you need exercise. I went, all right, okay. So I've gone away, and uh, I was a wee while later, I went back to her. I said, that hasn't worked. She said, what hasn't worked? I said, you said that I need extra fries. I said, but that's not working. All it's doing is put, putting weight on me. She said, I fucking said the exercise. I was like, right, okay, now we're talking. <laughs> so um, so that was, that was a culture shock. I don't working. think I could handle any more dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> so working uh, working with KF working with KFE has suited me for the the last few years, Mark. For well, the last the last fourteen years, and I think it's suited KFE as well. Um, we've got a very good working. You're an asset. We've got a very you're, good you're working an asset. relationship. You're... I love I who love sells more ranges than you. Guy. Who sells more ranges than you at KFE? I'll tell you. Uh, no uh, this year. <laughs> yeah, or last well, year or the year I, before. I, I don't count how many ranges I sell, but if I was counting, I would know it was 226. But um, but I don't right. count. So, <laughs> But do you know what, Mark? I've met some of the nicest people that, uh, that I would never have met if I'd still been in the shops. Um, sometimes yeah. you stick your head above the parapet. And, and, and you know, there's a, there's a saying that goes, I'd rather be sorry for something that I'd done than for something that I didn't do. Because I think yeah. that when you do things, you stick your head above the parapet sometimes, and and um, opportunities arrive. Yeah. When opportunities arrive, uh, you take them. You don't take them, but if, as long as you're as long as you're out and about, opportunities are there. So um, the opportunity to work for for KFE was uh, was good for me. It was good for them. I've met some lovely people. I've been part of so many journeys into fish and chips. We've got the fish works, sea salt and soul, the fish market in New Haven. There's so many uh, so many businesses that have been there at the start of their journey, and um, and and see how they they progress and and get on. And uh, and yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, you're you're still winning awards, but through other people that you're helping, and and I'm doing the same. You know, you, yeah. um, the the consultancy, the the shops that I'm working through, mainly yeah. through KFE. Um, you know, when I go to the awards now, it's because I've I've worked with someone, and I and and I see them lift a trophy, and and that's that's really rewarding because you, you're not front and center in the limelight, and I'm sure there are lots of people that owe a debt of gratitude to you for, for how you've transformed their business. Look, we've been talking now for nearly two hours. So no, I need, broken. I'm serious. We need, what I need to do is um, I want to wrap this up and put a bow on it, but I want to go out on an up. Um, uh, and it's really important to me. I've absolutely loved the chat, um, but I want to give you an opportunity to just recognize some of the people that you've worked with, some of the people that have had an influence, um, uh, and 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 to to just point point you know tip your hat to them um, before we before we call it a night. I know you've not had any dinner yet, and and you've been stuck <laughs> with me. That's not unusual. That's, Do you know what, Mark? I, uh, we've had uh, that's, twelve hours. The, the that question that you've asked me is a is a difficult question to answer. I think some of the people that I've spoken about in the last two hours as you've pointed out um, are people that uh, are holding uh, in, in very good regard but I suppose um, I suppose I wouldn't go by acknowledging the fact that my wife has been absolutely brilliant She's. I married her 40 years ago we got married 40 years ago and I married her because I fancied her and she was energetic yeah. And 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 we got a lot of laughs, and we got a lot. We had a lot of fun. And I was I married her when I was twenty. She was older than me. She was twenty one, and I was twenty. So we've been married for forty years. And and I actually she's love a lovely her woman. More. I actually love her more now than I did then because in the days, as I said, it was laughs, it was looks, it was it was the energy that she had. 
But you add to that then the, the faithfulness, the honesty and the loyalty throughout a marriage. And then when things go wrong, you add the support and the strength that, 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 that she's offered me over the, over the years. Um, so I actually love her more. You've got two amazing daughters as well, haven't you? My, my two daughters are, are, are very much the same. Very much the same. Yeah. I don't know how they put up with me during the during the years that I was I was working continuously. They had to come to work for me then to see to see me the way I did with my own yeah. dad. And I feel a wee bit bad about that sometimes. I've apologised to them for that for that absence. They forgive you. They, <laughs> they, they did you. forgive me. They did forgive me. They said, "Dad, it's okay. We were driving BMW, so it was fine." They didn't actually. They're not. They're not materialistic girls at all. They're not materialistic girls no. at all. But yeah, so I think I'm going to restrict that to the to to the family members that that I've just spoken about here. My two daughters and my wife. Um, yeah. Because I'll be back in at that time, Mark. I, I was, and, and even now to a certain extent, I, I do a lot for myself. I look after myself. I look after me. I yeah. don't need anybody to look after me. As I say, the the people that we've spoken about during the last two hours or whatever it was. It didn't seem like two hours. It just seems like two minutes. But during the... During the um, I think that's acknowledgement enough for for them. They, they know who they are. They yeah. know who they are. Okay. Is there anything that you uh, thought that we might have talked about that we didn't brush upon? Because um, I know it's going to be uh, uh, a really long time before I get an opportunity to do something like this with you again. Were you hoping that um, something was would come up? Um is there anything else you want to say before before we say goodbye to the listener? Uh, no, for me it's not. I, 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 I'm tired of talking, Mark. I need a pint. <laughs> well, look, it, I've need, really enjoyed I it. I need a pint of cider. And, and you'll be expecting me to talk again when the students come in front of us tomorrow. That's thank great, you Mark. so much. No, I've really, you. really enjoyed it. Good to speak to you. Cheers.